I'm Kathleen Causey, Chair of the Policy Review Committee. I now call to order the meeting of the Policy Review Committee for Monday, September 21st, 2020, in accordance with the Board of Education's resolution approved at the March 10th, 2020 board meeting. In the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present. And that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's Policy Review Committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on the BCPS website. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Committee members will uh, state their name before uh, making a motion or asking for discussion. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Clark or Ms. Howie if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Clark, please call a roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Offerman? Present. Mr. Mihumza? Present. Ms. Rowe? Here. Ms. Scott? I'm sorry, here. And Ms. Causey. Here. All members are present. Thank you. We now have a quorum of the committee. Ms. Clark, can you also call a roll call of staff members that are present in this meeting? Ms. Howie? Here. It looks like Dr. Adams. Present. Are there any other um, staff members participating? I hear none, see none. Thank you. Thank you. So the item on the agenda in front of us now is approval of the minutes. The live video footage of the June 17th, 2020 meeting represents the minute of the meeting. The minutes stand approved as recorded. The next item on the agenda is item three, unfinished business policies scheduled for review in the 2020-2021 school year. And for that, Ms. Howie. Good afternoon, members of the committee. You have before you um, as item number three, the policies that have been uh, discussed that will be presented to uh, the board this year. The superintendent is required pursuant to superintendent's rule 8130 to inform the board of those policies that will be reviewed during the uh, upcoming school year. The policies that are starred are those that were done at the request of the Policy Review Committee. Policy 1290 is not on your seven-year schedule, but it is on, I'm sorry, 1270. That is an annual review. Uh, so these have already been um, distributed as far as the list to the full board and I simply present them to you again uh, to remind you of what is on the policy review committee's agenda for the upcoming year. Are there any questions? Any questions or comments board members? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. As well, board members, you, ha you have behind item number four, the meeting dates uh, for PRC for the upcoming year. Happy to take any questions. Hearing no questions, we can move on. Thank you. Members of the committee, uh, you have before you policy 8250 board member responsibilities. Staff is recommending two changes uh, to the policy. One is the result of a change in statute. And as a result of that change, and Mr. Mahomza, this is something that directly affects you, uh, the uh, scholarship for the student board member is, has been increased from $1,000 to $7,500. 
So we have included uh, that change in the policy. Because we were already amending the policy as a result of change to state law, and because uh, this policy also addresses board member absences, given what's going on with the current pandemic, we thought it wise that we include a definition of physical presence so that it was clear that a board member did not have to be physically present in order to be counted as present for a meeting. And those are the two changes that staff is recommending to policy 8250. Thank you, Ms. Howie. And I'll just call each uh, board member's name for the purpose of discussion. Mr. Offerman? No, uh, no, uh, excuse me, no questions. Mr. Mahamza? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, Ms. Howie, uh, for the student member of the board uh, scholarship, <laughs> um, that, okay, I guess. I guess my question is, um, I guess towards the end of the year, um, would that scholarship go directly to me in terms of like, um, I guess let me try to phrase this. Let's say I wanted to like donate that scholarship. Is that okay? That's perfectly um, fine if that's where you want. If you want the money to be donated uh, to a specific cause, it is remitted and has been in the past remitted directly to the student member of the board. Okay, so if like, let's say um, there's like a cause for the, a school or something that I wanted to donate to, would I have to go to like legal and say, um, I want to donate my scholarship, um, can you redirect that to so-and-so? I can certainly follow up with fiscal services to see what they need because obviously we want to make sure we're compliant with the statute, which doesn't make it um, doesn't make it optional for us to provide the the funds. So I will check with fiscal services about how they would want that uh, placed on their books, as it were. Okay, and uh, that board uh, policy about uh, attendance would that be only mm -hmm. for the, uh, this year, or would it be the policy that we continue with? The way that it's written, it is not just for this year. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Rowe? Yes, um, mm -hmm. I, I do have a couple of questions. Really one. So, Ms. Howie, one of the things that I was wondering is we have the board handbook, and the board handbook mm -hmm. outlines some of this stuff. Is there anything that needs to be in this policy or is it another policy that references the handbook as authoritative? Um, because I don't really ever see the words and as outlined in the board handbook anywhere in our policies. And I wondered about that because we do talk about member responsibilities a lot in the handbook and articulate it more than we do in this policy. So uh, the handbook is clearly adopted by the board and ha has been adopted by the board at least when it was first, um, first created. So I view, given its adoption by the board, I view that as part of the board's legislative function. Uh, therefore, again, in my mind, the handbook is comparable to board policy because the full board has taken action on it in the same way that the board has on policy. Uh, I have not uh, reviewed the board handbook. It was sent, I understand, to uh, board council, but I have no objection if that's what the committee's pleasure is, that the handbook be referred to in policy or that the handbook be referred to as related. So a related document, you have a related policy section can certainly have um, related documents for handbook. I'm satisfied to have it there with related documents. I think it just okay. needs to be referenced in some way. I agree with you that it is authoritative because it's a board action. I just like to see things connected. Mm -hmm. Understood. Okay, so we can add that to the policy and therefore to the analysis as well. Sure. 
I have no other questions for this one. Thank you. Ms. Howie, does that require a motion and uh, vote by the floor? It doesn't require a motion to change the analysis because that's not a document that you vote on anyway. It would require a motion to change if you want to add um, other documents to the policy itself. So Ms. Rowe, would you like to make a motion to, um, to that? Um, sure. Uh, how would this, hang on, let me look at the policy. I've got too many windows open. Perhaps I move that um, policy 8250 be amended as follows by adding a new section uh, starting at approximately line 23 on page two, related documents, Board of Education handbook. So moved, as stated by Ms. Howie. Is you there a second? A second? I'm sorry, is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mahamza. Any discussion? Ms. Uh, Clark, if you could call a roll call vote, please. Yes, uh, Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mihumza? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Yes. And Ms. Causey? Yes. yes. Thank you. And Ms. Scott, did you have questions or comments related to policy 8250? Uh, no, I did not. Thank you. Thank you. So I had a um, point of discussion for um, page one, paragraph three, paragraph three, about line 23 on page one. Mm -hmm. It states each board member shall notify the secretary treasurer or his or her designee of non-attendance in advance of the beginning of the board meeting. I would like to um, propose an amendment so that it would state each board member shall notify the board chair, vice chair, secretary treasurer or his or her designee and the board executive assistant of non-attendance in advance of the beginning of the board meeting at the earliest possible. I'm sorry, at the earliest possible opportunity. Thank you. So that's my motion. Is there a second? Second row. Thank you. And just to briefly speak to it, um, especially given the pandemic and um, sometimes the uncertainty of um, people's access to technology, uh, dealing with family members' health or other situations, I think it would be helpful to have uh, the executive circle all receiving that information at the same time. Is there other discussion related to this motion? Yeah, uh, just my only question will be that, um, so is the motion saying that we have to notify all four or, or like four or five individuals? Yes. Okay. And so let, let's just say hypothetically, um, we notify uh, the chair and the superintendent, I guess, but we miss out like the vice chair, like we just miss it because there was something that, like an emergency or something, would board members be penalized for not including all four? That's, I guess that's my only question. I don't know that you can penalize a board member exactly. Um, I mean, we have to follow our policies, but I think if an email to all of those people is sent, you know, at the earliest opportunity, I think that's compliant with the policy. The idea is to expand the policy so that more people are in the circle than just one person. 
particularly because the secretary treasurer is the superintendent, and the superintendent's very busy. And if if someone tries to get hold of the superintendent to tell them they can't come, then it's possible that board leadership who are running the agenda may not find out until the meeting. And it's just an idea that the more people who are in the circle of the board officers who know, the most likely it is that that information is going to be disseminated prior to the meeting, particularly if something happens very close to the start of the meeting. Yeah, so, no, no. I don't know that it's about penalty so much as just having it in policy, including more than just that one person. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I was wondering, like, let's say there's like an emergency family thing, and uh, let's say I, I like I guess have the phone number of the sec. I, I call Miss Causey, but I, I I'm like unable to call the other people individuals uh, that pertain to this uh, amendment. What um, would my absence still be counted? Oh, like what happened? I guess that's my question. Ms. Talley, how would you interpret Ms. Muhammad's question in terms of um, a penalty? I don't, as Ms. Rowe points out, the board doesn't hand out unexcused absences. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. But, but it is a good question, Mr. Mahamza. So it's clear that under 3B, that the failure to attend without good cause is subject to some sort of adverse action against an individual board member. Um, I've only known that that's happened once in the last uh, 27 years that the board even attempted um, to, um, to use or invoke this particular authority. There does not seem to be any authority attached to sub A. Uh, there does not seem to be any implication that um, failing to notify these four individuals will result in some sort of adverse action. I do not think, however, that that means that that eliminates, let's say, that a board member just doesn't notify anyone and doesn't show up. Um, I would think that the board chair, uh, that the board leadership would want to address that issue with an individual board member, or else why would you have the language in the policy? So that's, um, those are tied together as you, as you say, because paragraph B has a circumstance, a consequence. Mm -hmm. um, and without good cause is an excuse that's given to someone. So um, in that regard, I think it's actually better to communicate to four people if you're trying to get across the point um, that you're having a situation and you're not going to be there in terms of making sure that your good cause is communicated. Is there language that would preclude uh, any consequence related to paragraph A? Well, as I said, I don't know that you want to clearly indicate that there is no consequence. Because if you do have a board member who simply doesn't notify, and let's say that that board member is under the 75% threshold, wouldn't the board want to be able to say to that board member, in, is that this is a norm, that this is an expectation? And let's say that the failure of an individual board member to show up and to notify the board results in a lack of a quorum. The board uh, could have had the opportunity to reschedule a meeting um, as opposed to holding a meeting, meeting that uh, doesn't have a quorum, so you're not able to take action. So again, right. I would think that even if you don't want to clearly indicate in this policy that, or in this section, that there's some sort of um, some sort of action, adverse action that the the board can take, if this is the expectation, I would think you would want the expectation to be communicated. Thank you for that. Board members, other questions or comments? 
Yes, hi, this is Ms. Scott, and I just want to make sure I understand. So basically it's saying that um, board members have to, um, if they're not going to be able to attend the meeting, um, whichever meeting that is, even if it's like a first meeting, they're not going to be able to attend. They have to alert four people, the superintendent, the chair and vice chair, and the superintendent's um, uh, secretary. Is that correct? I thought, uh, and then Ms. Causey obviously made the motion, but I thought it was the, the board's administrative assistant, not the superintendent's administrative assistant. The board's administrative assistant, the language that's already in here references the secretary treasurer or his or her designee. Okay, so it's their designee, okay. Okay, um, all right, so then, so it's each time for each absence, a board member must alert those four people. And what yeah. we were just debating was if a board member did not do those things, what the consequences would be for not alerting or not letting all four of those individuals know and if that person was under, I guess, a 75% of attendance, um, what action, I guess, the board would take? And, but that's not in, the language isn't in there. And is, were you suggesting that we add that language? Or, um, I guess, I didn't hear any sort of resolution or conclusion. It's just that that language just isn't in there. I was not suggesting adding it. I was simply saying that it seems to me if you want to have a standard, you have a standard. And it makes sense that a board member should notify someone uh, so that you can avoid having uh, a meeting that fails for lack of a quorum or a meeting that, at which you're not able to do business. Okay, thank you. Other um, discussion of the motion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahunza? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Mrs. Causey? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. Board members, are there any other questions or comments related to policy 8250? Okay, then the question is, um, may I have a motion to move policy 8250 to the full board for first reader as amended? So moved, Offerman. Second. Thank you. Is there a second? Ms. Rowe was the second. Oh, thank you, Ms. Rowe. Any discussion? Can I have a roll call vote, please? Yes, Mr. Offerman. Yes. Mr. Mahumsa? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Mrs. Causey? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Members of the board, uh, you now have policy AT311, uh, which is your meeting policy. Uh, again, this was not on your uh, agenda for review this year, but given uh, the current pandemic and the way in which the board has changed its operations in order to meet virtually, both as a board and both as we are now as a committee, um, this policy was uh, amended, staff is recommending uh, some amendments which include um, a rather detailed appendix. So um, I believe Ms. Uh, Gover sent out to you earlier in the year uh, the special rules of order, sample rules of order that the Roberts Rules Association was recommending with respect to electronic meetings. And that's essentially what you have in the appendix to this policy. You also have in this policy uh, the concepts and the language that you've already adopted in your COVID um, memorandum uh, uh, that the board itself adopted back in March. So this simply operationalizes by putting in policy what the board has already adopted um, in, its, um, in its own action in the resolution that was adopted 
on March 10th. Uh, are there any questions? We'll just go around, Mr. Offerman? None. Mr. Mahamza? None. Ms. Rowe? Um, I have seven, actually, so if you'd like to come back to me last, that's fine. Ms. Scott? I don't have any questions. Ms. Rowe, do you want to go at this time? Okay, so one of the first things I noticed in the policy is how does the majority of the board call a meeting exactly and where's the process outlined? And I was wondering if we need the language that says something to the effect of during the agenda portion of any meeting, any board member may make a motion to hold a special meeting for specific agenda items that would require majority approval. Um, so you're that asking- was held on an off Tuesday. I'm sorry, so you're asking for a change to sub three, um, which addresses special meetings of the board? Hang on, let me find it here. Yeah, so we have public meetings and mm -hmm. it says that the chair or the board can call a meeting. And mm -hmm. I'm not aware how the board would call a special meeting and still be in compliance with Open Meetings Act. So what I was wondering is that if we could put in that section language that would allow a board member at a meeting to, in the agenda section of our board meeting, make a motion to hold a special meeting and have it voted on at a regular meeting and specify what would be included in that meeting. So in the past, what's happened has been that without your policy, uh, the board has asked for additional meetings, uh, special meetings on the budget, and that's been voted on as regular part of your agenda. So I'm so, not quite sure. So those I'm meetings sorry? are all those meetings are all meetings that were initiated by the board chair, and it's clear to me how the board chair initiates holding a meeting if the board mm -hmm. chair wants to. It is mm -hmm. not clear to me how the full board would initiate um, a meeting if, for instance, a chair didn't want to, but the board felt they had seven votes exactly when would that be moved and voted on because it would never be on any agenda and what i'm suggesting is that we add language to allow for motions to hold special meetings in the agenda portion of our regular meetings so that i mean i imagine it's unlikely that this would arise because nobody's trying to have thousands of meetings but the mechanism needs to be there and it's not clear to me that there is a mechanism at this point I think I understand your request. So if you will allow me to, um, to uh, present some revisions, if that's the uh, desire of the full committee, I'm happy to do that and work on some revisions. So do I need to make a motion for revisions to allow for that capability or? Just so we're sure that it's the desire of the full committee, yes, ma'am. Okay, so I move that staff recommend revisions to allow for um, board members to vote, initiate a vote to ha hold a special meeting. Is there a second? I'll second. I'll second that. Oh, Mr. Mahamza, is that you? Yeah. Okay. Um, Ms. Rowe, did you have anything else to say to your motion before we entertain questions from other committee members? No, I do not. Thank you. Board members, are there any questions or discussions related to Ms. Rowe's motion? This is Mr. Offerman. Uh, yes. I just want to make sure that 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 that, that, 
But I understand that the intent of this is to give the board a process in order to uh, in in order to uh, schedule a, a meeting. Uh, is that is that correct? Be, be, beyond the ones that are that are uh, that are uh, already scheduled. Mm -hmm. So our policy right now reads: special meetings of the board may be called by the board by the chair or by a majority of the board. So there is no process currently for a majority of the board to call a special meeting because there is no place where scheduling meetings appears on our agenda. So any such motion would be out of order because it would never be on our agenda. And I'm suggesting that that we have staff work on language to eliminate that problem. Uh, that's fine. We Thank you. Do that language. Mr. Mahomsa, did you have questions or comments? Well, I have questions or comments. Ms. Scott, did you have questions or comments on Ms. Rose's motion? Yes, yeah, so my question is so that at any time, um, is what Ms. Rose's motion saying that at any time, any member of the board or it would have to be a majority of the members of the board could call a special meeting at any time, regardless no, of the subject. The idea that I had that um, Ms. Howie could work on is that just like we add things to the agenda and it requires seven members to approve an addition to the agenda, at that point in our meetings, we could also hear motions for special meetings. So a member could motion, a member could move to hold a special meeting for some purpose outside of a regular meeting. And then the board, it would have to be seconded. And then the board would have to have a majority vote on holding that. Back. But the way I see it, either we eliminate special meetings of the board may be called by the chair and eliminate or by a majority of the board, or we have to specify how a majority of the board makes that motion. But I feel that we have to do one or the other. Okay, thank you. Ms. Howley, did you have a comment related to that question? Uh, I think I understand what Ms. Uh, Ms. Rowe wants to do. And Ms. Uh, Clark reminds me that the next policy we're addressing is the agenda. So it's possible that the mechanism that Ms. Rowe is looking for is um, within policy 8314 and not policy 8311. I had considered that too and had comments for that policy, but I wasn't mm -hmm. sure, so I wanted to bring it up during this one. Understood. Um, yes, so I guess Okay, so this policy 8311 is meetings. Yes. And what Ms. Rowe has asked is for staff to um, make a revision that provides specifics of a mechanism for a majority of the board to call a special meeting. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And as I recall in the past, it's been at your meetings. You have not violated the Open Meetings Act uh, by calling special meetings, uh, special public meetings, that is. Uh, so it's been within the context of discussions of items when the board has realized that it does not have sufficient time. But I will work on language uh, to mechanize the process. Okay, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. So, board members, any other discussion before we take a vote? Okay, hearing none, Ms. Clark, may we have a roll call vote? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Offerman? Uh, yes. Mr. Mahumza? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Scott? Abstain. And Mrs. Causey? Yes. Thank you. Um, Ms. Rowe, you said you had additional points to consider. 
Yes. So in the section where it says the board may find it necessary to meet electronically, mm -hmm. um, I find it problematic that this is stated as though it is an option, not necessarily the result of an emergency. And I'm wondering if we should insert some kind of language where it would say the board may find it necessary in the event of emergency situations to meet electronically. Because I feel like meeting electronically should only be for emergency situations and not simply because someone decided they just wanted to. And emergencies so are addressed in the appendix. So I would refer you to um, the appendix uh, lines four, page one, lines four through 17. So is that appendix part of the policies as they are published? Or is it something we're just seeing when we're reviewing the policies? No, it would be part of the, it would be an appendix to the policy. So in the same way that there are forms that are appended to superintendent's rules, this would be an appendix that, that is appended to the policy. So are you saying that you don't feel that it's necessary to add that language? I don't think I said that. Uh, I think what I said was that there, that emergencies are addressed in the appendix. I'm, I'm curious to know what the consensus of the committee thinks before making a motion that we would then have to vote on. If, if so feels there should be language that explicitly states electronic meetings are for emergency purposes, or do you think it could be at any time? I'm sorry, ma'am. Was that question to me, or was I thought that was for your no, fellow I'd like, committee members? Yeah, I'm asking the fellow committee members what they think about the subject. Uh, this is Mr. Offerman. Uh, I would like more time to look at at the uh, at the policy or the uh, or the excuse me the proposed policy, and ask that we maybe uh, put this off until the next meeting. Is that a possibility? So, Mr. Offerman, to your point, um, Ms. Howie, we did pass a motion to uh, for you to uh, bring back revision. So, mm -hmm. I I think that is um, a possibility. What um, I think what we should do is process through all of Ms. Rose's um, points, and then we can take uh, a motion to. Um, allow staff to incorporate changes and then bring it back. Okay, so my next point is that the policy um, draft states that we're going to quote, show the text of pending motions. How mm -hmm. are we going to do that in the platform and are we changing platforms? I'm not aware of how we can show the text of pending motions in our electronic meetings currently and if we make it a policy that we have to do it, mm -hmm. how are we supposed to facilitate that? Because I'm not aware that we can at this moment, and that may actually be a question for Mr. Corns. And I did speak with Ms. Gover. I don't want to put her on the spot without her being here, uh, but the agenda can be displayed. Um, and documents can be displayed. And this is simply for ease of reference for your fellow board members. The fellow board members have access to motions. They can be placed in the chat, uh, in the chat feature. So it was again to, uh, it was ease of reference for fellow board members. Um, this is consistent with the sample rules that, um, is, that are in the 12th edition of uh, Robert's Rules of Order. So it's, to make sure that every member of an assembly here, every member of the board knows the exact text of a motion as it's being discussed and ultimately voted upon. Okay, so um, 
it's not necessarily that we would be displaying that text for the public. It could be in the chat so that all the board members can see it. Yes, ma'am. The thing I find interesting about that is that we don't see the text of motions even when we're meeting in person. So I know. while it's helpful to see the text of motions meeting virtually, I find it interesting that we've crossed over into requiring something virtually that we don't require in person. I'm not saying that you shouldn't require it in person. It just hasn't been up till now. Uh, I'm not saying we I shouldn't think it's require the best it in person either, but I, fi I just find that interesting. Um, if the platform allows it, I have no problem with doing it. I just wanted to clarify that. So my other thing is, D reads like once we resume meetings in person, any board member who cannot physically attend in person would have the right to do so virtually. And I'm concerned with the designation of the meeting, either meeting being virtual or in person. And if it is in person, then members need to attend in person or they're not in attendance. And personally, I'm not interested in creating some kind of a hybrid scenario where we have people, we have an in-person meeting, but we have people who simply decided to, in, to attend virtually. I think that uh, we need to clarify that language so that if we're having if we're having virtual meetings for the purpose of emergencies mm -hmm. and we go back to having in-person meetings mm -hmm. then i don't like the idea that this policy because it's codified in policy that outside of the pandemic you could have simply simply say oh well i can't make it tonight i'm just going to sign in virtually or whatever. And mm -hmm. um, I feel like we need to work on that language so that it's clear that if the meeting designation is in person, you're expected to be there in person. And if the meeting designation is that it's virtual, you're expected to be there virtually, if that makes sense. It makes sense. And uh, I believe, and I'm sorry, I don't have the, the original notes, but I believe that this was a request of some board members that if we do return uh, in part to face-to-face -face meetings that board members continue to have the option um, based on personal circumstances and obviously after discussion with the board chair to be able to meet virtually. So, so is certainly that, it's the it's the board's desire. So if it's not the board's desire, it comes out of the policy. I think that that's something that may need greater in-depth circumstances because I could see how that could lead to something that our constituency and even the legislature never intended when we have in-person meetings. And I think that it creates a completely different type of situation when you have some members attending virtually and some members attending in person. And then it begs the question, under the circumstances that a person might be attending virtually, are they really there in the meeting or are they attending to the reason why they can't attend in person? So if the reason you can't attend in person is your child's child, well, mm -hmm. you're still taking care of your sick child. So you can't really attend the meeting. And in which case it should be an excused absence from the meeting, not an attempt to try to do both things at one time. And I don't, I don't think the legislature has ever spoken to this, but this might be one of those things that we could get the state board's guidance on if we continued to do it, because I'm not sure that that's something that would be supported given that we have state requirements for attendance and being there in person. It sort of opens a whole can of worms. So Ms. Rowe, I'm Again, gonna- it's up to the board. Uh, so just so you know, to, to, um, I mean, I, I am very creative, but I'm not so creative that I think of some of these options without any sort of foundation. This is consistent again with the sample rules in the 12th edition of Robert's rules, uh, of order. So, no Ms. Ro so Ms. Rowe, I'm going to take a moment because we do have board members that, um, have raised their hands. So they sure. would like to comment on this issue. So we're going to. Um, in the order I see them, Mr. Mahamza, then Mr. Offerman, then Ms. Mr. Mahamza. Yeah, um, thank you, uh, Ms. Uh, Rowe, for bringing up this question. Um, I'm just concerned that if we uh, uh, mandate that board members, if we go back, let's say December or something, and we man mandate that board members have to return uh, all like in person or you're counted absent, I just think it would lead to a slippery slope because we do have board members who are like older and 
might be in the high risk uh, range medically to uh, and might not want to come in person. So I'm just concerned if we take away this uh, option for them to meet virtually. Sorry, <laughs> I'm out of breath for a second. If we take uh, this option away for them to meet vir virtually, then some board members might not even want to come back at all. And then what do we do? I guess that's what I'm concerned. Okay, thank you for sharing that point. And Mr. Alterman, you also wanted to. Yeah, I am one of those older board members. And uh, I strongly feel that, 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 that given this unusual situation, uh, and as long as COVID is, is, uh, is, is, is driving so, so much of what we do and, and, and we don't do, that, that we leave up to each individual member uh, uh, the, the decision to, to be involved either in person or virtually. Uh, again, I, I have I have conditions that, that that would make my attendance perhaps more risky than uh, m many many of the other members, and I'm sure that other people on the board board uh, also have this. So before we do a hard and fast rule about virtual or not at all or partially virtual, I'd like to see I'd like to see those ideas you know uh, thought about. Thank you. And Ms. Scott. Yes, thank you. Um, and I would like to echo what uh, Mr. Mahomes and Mr. Offerman said. I, I do feel that, um, again, we do have members who may be more at risk than, than other members. And, um, and because of that, I don't think that we should, and I certainly wouldn't want to um, impose um, maybe something that may not apply to me, but could be detrimental to another member. And each person has to decide for themselves. And their history and their their health of, of um, what it means. We don't know when the pandemic is going to end. So I think uh, just a, a, a rule that's hard and fast um, would not be um, in the best interest of, of this body. Thank you. So to answer that, I'm not suggesting that for the sake of COVID-19 that we can't make exceptions to policy because we do that by resolution. But I feel like when we're making policies, we have to make our policies so that they're applicable to both COVID-19 and non-COVID-19. And I wouldn't object to members choosing to attend virtually if other members decided they wanted to attend in person. And I don't object to people being able to make that choice. But I think we have to be very careful how we word that in policy so that the same policy once the COVID-19 is over isn't then used for Oh, I went to the beach this weekend. I'm going to attend some beach because I'm at the beach, or some other scenario that isn't what was intended by the change in the policy. And I, I would like to see the language reflect that if we do that, it's for the sake of a transmissible pandemic, not simply because some members are deciding they're not going to be at the meeting. So I um, appreciate the input and I can see um, some valid points and I'm looking through Ms. Howie, the uh, appendix mm -hmm. and it's, it says on page five, paragraph three, individuals board member electronic participation, that individual board members may participate electronically subject to the following conditions. A, the board member shall obtain the permission of the chair prior to electing participation by electronic means. Um, and then it goes on to um, speak to how they participate, either vice mm -hmm. president. So I um, also am sympathetic to uh, board members and staff as well um, participating in meetings virtually even um, when it may be safe for the majority of the participants to come in person, even if it's socially distanced and with following CDC guidelines with masks and so forth. Um, so I think that that's something that, um, we're, but we're five members of the full board. So I guess the question is, we want to make a motion to 
provide staff with guidance for making a revision or um, before it gets presented to the full board, or we could leave it as it stands now, where individual board members could participate electronically uh, if they receive permission from the, from the chair. Is that how, am I reading that correctly, Ms. Howie? Yes, ma'am. Okay. That's what, I, I'm sorry, excuse me, That this is Ms. Scott. That, that was what I wanted to clarify. So in order for a board member to participate virtually, they have to get permission here to do yes, so? Yes, ma'am. As, mm -hmm. as it stands now. Mm -hmm. Yes, oh, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. So Ms. Scott, I think, um, I think to your question, um, at the very top of page five, in the event of an emergency, board meetings may be conducted electronically. Um, and in oh, paragraph C, an emergency meeting will automatically be conducted without action of the chair or the board when the governor declares a state of emergency. So when there's a state of emergency, board members don't need to ask me permission. Is that correct? Well, actually, the entire board meeting would be uh, virtual, not just individual board members um, opting not to come to a face-to-face. -face. When individual board members wish to participate it's electronically, that is um, when there is a face-to-face -face meeting. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so, Ms. Rowe, unless you wanted to make a motion specific to this point, um, do you want to address your other points? Um, I'll address my other points, and committee members can think about this as we discuss this in the next committee. Um, I think that if we're attending virtually, that the policy should mandate that video be used at least while speaking and voting. I've heard a lot from our constituents that other bodies use video more than we do. And I think that that would be a good addition to policy. Um, and I'm just so, gonna cover these last three things because they're related. The other thing is virtual attendance kind of needs to be a secure location without other people in the room during closed and administrative sessions. Mm -hmm. um, so those two things are kind of related. So those are my last two items on this policy. And just so I'm clear, when you say using video, so the individual board member should be required to turn on his or her video feed during board meetings? Well, so we require students to use their video feed in the classroom. And parents mm -hmm. want to know why we don't use our video feed in board meetings, but we're requiring students to use their video feed. And I think that our policy should state that board members must use their video feed while they're speaking and voting. Minimum. Mr. Rowe, do you want to make a motion to that effect? Because that's not currently in the policy. I move that we add to the policy. Board members will use video minimally while speaking and voting. Is there a second? I will second that. I have um, also received feedback from our community um, about, here, let me turn my video on while I'm speaking. Um, I've also heard um, feedback from our community members where um, board members are making very important decisions. They're, um, contributing to very significant conversations and that it's helpful to see that, to see the engagement and see, um, to, to, to see the members. So that's why I would support that. Um, do you want to speak any more to your motion before I ask other board members for comments? No, I think it. I think it speaks for itself. Other the county council, other bodies use their cameras. Oh, here, let me turn mine on. Sometimes I think it's just a case of forgetting to hit the little button. But 
I think that if we're speaking or we're voting, then it makes sense to have the camera active. And um, I think that the putting that in policy, that that's a good thing. Okay, thank you. Um, other board members, discussion? Mr. Mahamza? You're, you're not, you're muted. We cannot hear you. So while we are waiting for Mr. Mahamza to reconnect with us, Ms. Scott. Um, yes, thank you. Um, I was just checking because I understand um, uh, what was just said as far as um, requiring board members to use the video camera and such. Um, but it looks like it was just said that um, uh, we don't actually require as a system that we don't require the students to um, turn on their video feeds in school. So that's not a BCPS requirement. And correct me if I'm wrong, that is that something that just uh, the teacher, a specific teacher may require um, I just wanted to get that comment that it's not system wide, but it's the individual teacher may ask that their students all are on camera. Ms. Howie, is there well, staff that can speak to that question for Ms. Dr. Scott? Adams is on the call. I would uh, defer to him. Dr. Adams? Um, yes, I'm here. Good afternoon, everyone. Good I'm afternoon. sorry. Um, I did not want to interrupt since it was not my topic, but I thought I would um, put that information out there. Um, first, let me say certainly um, across social media platforms, there have been um, netiquette instructions that have been um, circulated widely. Um, but from a system standpoint, we have determined that we would not mandate that students turn on their cameras um, for a variety of re reasons. Some students may not feel comfortable showing the contents of their homes. Um, they may, there are a lot of a variety of reasons why students don't want to. And so we understand that some teachers may require on camera presence. We are hoping that is for specific activities and not as a teacher led mandate because our guidance has really been for teachers to co construct, um, especially that portion of the classroom experience with their students, understanding that everybody may not be as comfortable on camera. Thank okay, you. Thank you for that. So if it's not mandated, um, uh, I guess, by the system, what we're saying then, I guess the motion was then that we mandate board members to do that. Do I understand that correctly? Um, yes, because it's something that our constituents want is to be able to see us. I don't know that I feel like it's necessary to have every single camera on through the whole entire meeting. But I think that it's it's definitely beneficial when we're not meeting in person that speaking and voting could have the camera on. So obviously, if the board doesn't agree, then then we don't put it in policy. But I think it's a good idea. Thank you, Mr. Mahams is back. Yeah, Miss um, Scott actually asked my question. That was thank you, Miss Scott. Thank you. Any other questions or comments related to this motion before I call a vote? Um, Ms. Rowe, would you just restate the motion? I move that policy require board members minimally to use their video when speaking and voting. Thank you. I, Ms. Scott, is your hand up? Again, you said Ms. Scott. No, my hand is fine. I thought it was. Oh, sorry. Okay. All right. Um, hearing nothing further, Ms. Clark, I have a little call for Yes, Ms. Offerman. Excuse me. Mr. Offerman. No. Mr. Mahumsa. I'm seeing. Ms. Rose. Ms. Rose. Sorry, it's hard yes. to hear. 
Oh, sorry, there's oh. someone that's got their mic muted and something very loud in the background. Miss Scott? No. Mrs. Causey? Yes. So that motion fails. Ms. Causey, Ms. Pasteur is with us. Is it her intention to vote? Um, Ms. Pasteur no. is a welcome um, attendee, but she is not a member of the not committee. The um, so I, she's, I not, she's not able to vote. Did she have her hand up to speak? No. Okay. I just saw her come in, so. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ms. Pasture, and welcome. Thank you. Okay, so Ms. Rowe, that motion did not carry, and did you have any additional points for this policy? Did we lose Ms. Rowe? Ms. Rowe, I'm if you're- sorry. I'm here, it muted. Hang on, let me, let me say that again. I move that the policy state that virtual attendance needs to be in a secure location without other people in the room during closed and administrative sessions. Is there a second? I'll second that. Do you want to speak to your motion? Um, given that we hold closed and administrative sessions uh, in privacy and have confidentiality obligations, I think that it's very important that when we're attending this these sessions virtually, that we're not doing so in a place where other people can overhear the session. And I think that we need to specify that since we don't have a lot of guidelines specified about virtual meetings. And, you know, it's not, I lock my doors so my kids can't run in and out during closed administrative sessions. And I, I'm in a room where there's no one else. And that protects the statutory mandated privacy of those sessions. And I think that we should articulate in policy that when board members are attending virtually and they are in closed or administrative session, they need to be doing so in a room that there are no other people in. You're muted, yeah, Ms. Cawley. Thank you. Uh, we have board members that would like to comment, and the first is Mr. Mahamza. Yeah, um, I totally agree with uh, what Ms. Rowe is saying that obviously a confidential uh, material should be, um, should have some kind of confidentiality. I'm just concerned if like we're mandated, mandating it for board members and like let's say a family member walks by or a, somebody's child or something, that, um, what implications does that have for that board member? Because it, it might be, it might, like it is ideal that we uh, keep it secret, but it's not always the case. Sometimes a family member just walks in uh, out of nowhere and you don't have time to tell them because you're in a meeting. So I guess that's my only concern. Thank you. Um, I was gonna say, Ms. Howie, do you have a comment here? Or Ms. Rowe, did you wanna respond first? But I, I did wanna ask Ms. Howie. Well, board members have been removed by the state board for revealing what happens in closed and administrative session. And I think that if, as a board member, you can't secure lo your location to attend virtually, then, you know, you might not be able to attend that session. Because if you were attending an in-person meeting and didn't have child care for your kids and had to bring your kids to the meeting, they would not be allowed to sit in with you in the closed session. So if we're trying to mimic as closely as possible virtual meetings, and if the state board has removed people for not maintaining the confidentiality of closed and administrative session, then I think it's incumbent upon the board member to do whatever they need to do to attend that meeting. I mean, I attended one closed session sitting in my truck because that was the only way I could ensure nobody would be interrupting or overhearing. So it is possible in this virtual world 
to attend virtually in a secure location where it's not possible for anyone to walk in. And I think that we need to mandate that. Yeah, like I said, I, I mean, I totally agree. Like, but what I'm saying is, what well, number one is uh, the people who got removed for revealing con confidential materials, I think it's totally different from, uh, I think that's a totally different case because obviously they were uh, revealing that information. I'm just saying that, uh, like for my house, for example, like I'm in my, uh, there's some certain parts of my house where Wi-Fi is very slow and glitchy. So that means I have to go like downstairs a certain spot. But the issue is people are walking in and out of that spot, that area. And that's like great for, um, that's the only spot where like my Wi-Fi doesn't glitch or anything. So if we're, and if that's the case for other board members, then I just feel that that could be detrimental to them if we're mand mandating this policy. And in terms of child care, um, in, some board members might have different situations where maybe child care is not possible for them during this time and they, they need to watch over their kids. So I just, I'm thinking, I guess, for other board members. Thank you. Ms. Howie, I guess I'm looking for um, clarification of um, the confidentiality setting for closed and administrative session. So certainly uh, when the board is discussing items in administrative function session and in closed session, it's closed to the public. Uh, and the expectation is that the reason that it's closed is to protect the privacy of individuals or to safeguard uh, information that could um, in some way damage procurement issues uh, security issues, there are valid reasons uh, that the legislature had for making items confidential. Uh, so as far as intentionally uh, releasing information that is received in closed session, uh, it is accurate, um, as Ms. Rowe has indicated, that the state board has, uh, has uh, addressed that with certain board members around the state. I think Allegheny County was the, the most recent one. Uh, so uh, in terms of possible negative action and whether or not that's an infraction, it's clear that is it has been deemed an infraction by the State Board of Education. As to measures that each individual board member should try to um, ensure uh, to try to make sure that the, uh, the confidentiality is safeguarded, that's, you're the board. You get to determine whether or not you do that through policy. Uh, and in terms of use of technology, headphones are a possibility, uh, obviously to safeguard um, the privacy of what's going on in closed session. Uh, if an individual's home is not conducive to going to a separate location. Certainly, um, as depositions are taken uh, virtually, uh, which happened prior to the pandemic, one of the things that um, usually is asked is, are you in a secure location? Are you being overheard? Uh, that's a, a standard question when individuals are either on the stand or being deposed. I see Ms. Scott has her hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, I think as much as possible, of course, we shall um, uh, try and be in a secure location where, um, a quiet location where um, we can't be overheard. Um, I do believe with everything going on with, with um, COVID-19 um, and people becoming uh, working from home, caregiving from home, taking care of children, because um, I think Ms. Rose said, uh, like a family member, I, I get that family members, but if your children are, you know, in and out of the room, I, I mean, and you're a parent, I think that's getting a little bit, a uh, little bit judgmental maybe. We don't know the circumstances of board members' home lives and what they have set up. Um, I think that we maybe could reiterate it. Um, you know, make sure board members that you're in a secure location. Um, but I don't know as far as uh, necessarily putting something like that in policy, especially as it relates to one's home life and children um, and things like that, um, if that might uh, be a bridge too far. Thank you. 
Does anyone else have a comment? Um, so I just have one thing. Um, yes. yes. If it satisfies people, I'm content if a person can't be in a room completely alone if they are wearing headphones and no one else can hear what's in the meeting. Um, if the second will accept an amendment to the motion in a secure room or wearing headphones. Um, I see Miss Howie. No. <laughs> Miss Howie. The motion's been made and seconded and already uh, discussed. Uh, so it's now in the, um, it's the property of the assembly. This is a small assembly. Uh, so motions can be, um, you, you can amend it. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So I would like to uh, make a comment if, if I can. I, I don't, I, I appreciate the conversation and we are in a pandemic and there um, are going to be circumstances in, in board members' lives beyond the pandemic as well. So the issue is, is a board member able to do the work of the board and are they able to do it virtually? And if part of the work of the board is to be engaged in a confidential presentation, conversation, motion, discussions, and votes, then the issue is we do need to hold board members to the expectation of law and policy. We have uh, uh, policies around personnel matters um, that uh, require confidentiality. So, um, and just as in normal life, if a board member is not able to be present at the meeting, um, and they have a, a, a reason, as uh, many have mentioned reasons, as an excused absence, then they just would not be uh, present for that portion of the meeting. Certainly when the board is engaged in the public parts of the meeting, just like public can be come into the boardroom, if public is coming into your living room and you're conducting your board business in an open meeting, then that's not the issue. The issue is the, the closed or administrative function. So I think that's, that's the difference. Um, so if there's, okay, Mr. Mahamza has your hand up again. Yeah, I guess um, I would accept uh, the, the amendment from Ms. Rowe talking about um, speaking to the point that uh, makes uh, a board member makes an attempt um, to maintain secrecy, whether it's through headphones, uh, location, et cetera. So I guess I would accept an amended version. So I, I'm, I, as the second, um, I, first of all, it's not parliamentarily, well, correct. No, 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 I'm just saying I looks. But um, as Ms. Howie was counseling us, I don't know that I would accept that. I, actually, I wouldn't. It, the, 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 the motion states they'll be in a secure location. And the manner in which they do that um, can be, you know, up to them to make sure that that's the case. But I don't know that in all cases I would consider being on a headset to be in a secure location. It, it would have to be the totality of the location, and it would be up to the board member to uh, diligently figure that out. And uh, uh, what, I, what, what I mean by that is that, um, let's say, like I, I'm going to use the example of connectivity. Um, certain parts of the house uh, have much better in, uh, internet connections, and maybe sometimes people are walk, might walk through, and you might warn them, please don't walk, uh, don't come near here during this certain amount of time. What I'm saying is, um, if you go, if you make, if you make an attempt to, maybe you, you can have headphones. Um, some kind of way to uh, maintain secrecy. I think I'm fine with that, but just simply saying that uh, board members should find a room uh, for confidential meetings, I'm, like, I'm not really okay with that one, uh, as the uh, motion stands. Okay, thank you. Did I see Mr. Offerman's hand up? Mr. Offerman? Yes. Uh I'm just going to uh, ask you to reiterate, or miss, you know, that, that 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 the definition of a secure location will will be done by the members, right? I mean, in, in the individuals, because you know, uh, that, 
I, I, I think at some point we have to trust that, that, that the people on the board are, are, are going to be able to make to take decisions in order to keep things private. When we met in person, we are aware of several instances where there was some information that was let out of that private meeting. So, you know, uh, and, and certainly we, we don't want that to, 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 put, to, to ever happen again. But, but, but I feel like, you know, I, I'll support this if, if we allow each board member to decide what is secure. Thank you. I'm satisfied with allowing each board member to decide what is secure, provided that the definition of secure involves due diligence to make sure other people are not overhearing the meeting. Yeah, that's what I was speaking to, Ms. Rowe. Okay, so um, okay. So we have a motion in a second. Um, I think we should take a vote on it. Um, I think we should take a vote on it. And then if there's additional conversation afterwards, we can process that. Ms. Clark, if you would uh, do a roll call vote. Yes, um, Mr. Offerman. Yes. Mr. Mahumsa. No. Ms. Rowe. Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Ms. Causey? Yes. So the motion carries. Um, I uh, will make a motion to ask staff to review the policy for any additional language to bring in the next revision related to board members being in a secure location for closed or administrative function. Second row. Um, I just want to speak to my motion. Um, in having all of this uh, very uh, robust discussion, I do think it's worthwhile for uh, the law office to um, review and see if there's any additional language that would be um, helpful without directing that language. So that's uh, why I'm making this motion. Mr. Offerman? Yeah, yes. Uh, am I correct in saying that after the staff uh, looks through this and perhaps provides some additional uh, guidance, we would uh, we would be able to vote yes or uh, yes or no this again, or, 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 is, or is this motion going, uh, going uh, forward the way it is? Um, so we had talked at the beginning uh, a little bit ago about having this policy come back at the next meeting. And so yes. the board, the policy review committee will be evaluating the whole thing again. So if there was language that was additional language that was uh, brought forward um, by staff, then the, the policy review committee members will, uh, will definitely have an opportunity to speak to it and make motions to modify it if if they so choose. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Rowe, did you have anything else? No, thank you for your patience, everyone. Thank you. So I'm gonna make a motion that um, staff have the opportunity to review policy 8311 as amended and per discussion and to bring it back to the committee at the next policy review committee meeting. Is there a second? Second row. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Yes, Mr. Offerman. Yes. Ms. Mahumza? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Mrs. Causey? Yes. The motion carries. So we are moving on to policy 8314 meetings agenda. Actually, Ms. Causey, uh, thank you. Ms. Causey, um, I beg the committee's indulgence. I do have a hard stop at 630, and I would not want the committee to uh, miss the discussion of policy 5210, grading and reporting, given that there are quite a number of individuals from CNI uh, here on the call now. 
um, and I'm happy to bring um, 83.14 um, and the ethics policies back for your consideration at the next board meeting if indeed the uh, discussion runs over on policy 52.10. Okay, um, committee members, unless I hear an objection, I will uh, move up the agenda, policy 52.10, grading and reporting. Thank you Hearing for your that, indulgence. Absolutely. Um, so, Ms. Uh, Howie, would you like me to begin on grading and reporting? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. So, um, policy 5210, uh, just as a, a brief history, in um, 2015, the spring of 2015, the Board of Education passed a uh, revised grading and reporting policy, which is the one that we still have um, currently. And it was a later that the, um, and the policy indicated that it would be implemented a, roughly a year later. So roughly a year later, there was a grading reporting manual, procedures manual that was uh, presented to the school system. And there was a large uh, amount of concern when it was first being implemented uh, from parents and uh, teachers. Um, and then there were some revisions made. And this board, I have heard from committee members and others, um, concerns around grading and reporting. And so this is just an opportunity, and I'm going to um, echo the equity committee uh, to talk about um, insights, to talk about um, goals, and then to talk about observations. And then just to speak briefly about what do we want to explore? What would help this committee evaluate uh, if the policy 5210 should stand as it is, uh, needs improvements, um, if the uh, procedures, if we feel that the procedures are aligned with the policy, um, or if there's some improvements that needed to be made. So um, at this point, I'm just going to go around to board members to speak to um, what their uh, thoughts, observations, or concerns are. And then, as Ms. Howie points out, we are um, we have taken quite a bit of time with some important policies, but uh, to move forward and that this will come back to the to to our committee. So I have. Um, Mr. Offerman's hand up, and I do believe Ms. Pasture, if she's still here, she had some time-defined issues. Okay, Mr. Offerman, and then Ms. Pasture has her hand up. Yes, uh, this is Mr. Offerman. I am uh, reading from the core beliefs in the grading and reporting policy document. And in there it says, and I'll quote, uh, every student will be successful when provided high expectations and sufficient appropriate supports. Uh, I and for one, strongly believe that high expectations would 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 include that a student that a student excuse me that a student would 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 be attending uh, a certain percentage of of, of the classes. Uh, this is not in the I don't believe this is in in the uh, in the uh, general policy, but maybe in the uh, in the uh, rule that that that. But the attendance plays no factor in the letter grade of the student. It does play a factor in the performance area, which is graded one, two, three, but not the letter area, which is graded A, B, C, D, and E. If we're preparing our students to go out into the future, I think a minimum expectation that we have to put on them is they recognize that if you don't attend, okay, I, I think your chances of being successful, whether it's at college or on the job or or in any organization, is 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 certainly is certainly very very, very limited. Uh, I also believe, and this is I don't have facts on this, of course, but that in the areas of elementary and middle school, attendance is more almost always based on the parents' ability to make sure the student gets to school. I do believe, and it's somewhat supported. Uh, Perhaps by the uh, by the data that's already been provided by staff, that that for uh, that for high school students, uh, this may not be as true. Uh, again, I, I don't have hard data on this, uh, but 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 this is my feeling. I do know, and this was reported by by staff, 
that 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 when the new policy was 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 uh brought, was uh was brought forth, that the attendance, particularly among seniors in high school, dropped. In fact, I believe it dropped in all three grades, 9, 10, 11, and 12, with with the uh, with the uh, 12th graders the worst. Now, this is school attendance. Uh, this does not, I don't, I don't believe, reflect class attendance, which I also now believe is available. And I would ask that when the staff looks at this situation, that that, that if they're possible, that they uh, that they look, look at the data about about uh, class attendance for uh, for the kids in in grades nine through twelve. I, you know, have a couple you know, kind of guiding thoughts on this. First of all, that we don't do policies for COVID and non-COVID. I don't, I, because of all the other issues, what, when, when we are virtual, I, I, I'm not, I don't think this is a, this is a thing that, 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 that I'm, that I'm, I'm as concerned about while we are virtual. I'm worried about this in terms of being when we are in person. Okay. Second of all, I do believe that if we do establish some great impact a, B, C, D, or E, based on based on students attending school and 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 or class, that we need to have a significant plan in place to allow for those students who have unusual circumstances, whether they be medical, which means of course physical or you know mental issues, or if they have family issues. We know a large number of our kids or some of our kids are taking care taking care of of. Uh, of uh, younger siblings at home, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure there that sure that there are like other other cases that I uh, that I uh, but I haven't seen this. Okay, and uh, with those two things in mind, I also believe that uh, uh, that this again should only impact high school coursework. I, I'm not concerned about or well, I'm concerned about attendance in. Uh, in uh, K through 12, I believe high school kids, for a variety of reasons, have have a lot of the decision making process of whether they attend not only school but whether they attend class. Things I've heard from from teachers are kids will be present in school, but but maybe attending multiple lunch shifts. Kids will be in school, you know, but 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 in fact, are not are not uh, are not attending class. And that with the current rules involving student makeup work, uh, I think there are a lot of students who are who are utilizing that allowance to not meet specific attendance uh, specific attendance excuse me specific attendance expectations, which I think is sort of minimal if we're really preparing kids to go out beyond beyond high school. Again, whether it's work, family, college. Or you know, or uh, or whatever avenues that uh, that uh, they pursue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Offerman and Ms. Pasteur. Yes, thank you, and thank you um, for letting me speak at this meeting. Uh, Mr. Offerman has uh, pretty much stated many of the things uh, that I'm feeling. Uh, I just want to. Uh, wrap around everything that he said, uh, that equity lens about which um, I think Ms. Um, Causey, you spoke at the beginning of, of this particular discussion. I'm, I'm um, concerned because we're not only teaching content, we're also supposed to be um, the messengers, the harbingers, the, the developers of habits for young people, um, and certainly school, and particularly in high school, we are, we say this repeatedly, preparing our children uh, for college and career. I'm perplexed as how we think we're preparing them for college and career if we don't hold attendance as an integral part of, of our expectations and, and what they should be about. I'm also having spent an inordinate amount of time, years and years, in schools um, on many levels, 
how we think we are going to meet those things that are in our policy when we're talking about course expectations, student progress, giving them meaningful feedback um, on achievement and looking at content standards based on evidence. If they're not present, how do we really measure them uh, in that regard? And some might say, well, then uh, there's your answer. They weren't there or they weren't there um, uh, enough times, or maybe they were there a lot of the times, but sometimes they just arbitrarily chose not to be. So that's the answer. So that will speak to the grade because they won't be able to present the evidence and do those things. But I'm living in the real world and I'm living in the real world of schools. And we understand that for whatever reason, especially when a system is, is um, using as part of any school system as its foundation and, and its demonstration of growth, um, graduation rates, um, daily attendance rates, then at the end, what we know, we know often happens is that children, uh, and I'm not talking about those that as Mr. Offerman spoke, who have really strong extenuating circumstances. And I want to address that in a moment with this. But when we start giving them those handouts, or we start asking teachers if they could meet with them um, uh, to offer uh, some support along with those handouts, just because they haven't been there, and we want to make sure that they move on. Our teachers are better than and more than, and their preparation is better than and more than um, some of the handouts or the quickies that they are gonna get after school so we can move them on for our numbers. This is about integrity, not just equity. So when our children learn that it's okay to just arbitrarily miss time because it will be attached to nothing because someone at some point is going to give them some makeup work that is not nearly as meaningful as the discussions and the opportunities they have when they are present. And then they go out to work and the expectation at college and at work is that they are present, that they are there that they are doing whatever they are hired, et cetera, to take care of. So we are setting them up. And again, back to the equity lens, I, I, I take it because I watched it because I lived in that world and I take it very personally um, and, and feel that our children need to be in schools, in classes, and they need to get the work that the teacher, as the teachers prepared it. Now, if they are sick, if there are issues with homelessness, if there are all of those issues that are real and real world, then when they're either on home and hospital or our PPWs, et cetera, are working with these young people, then it is, it should be on the system to make sure that these children are getting the kind of work that they need that is representative of who they are, where they want to go, and what we consider our integrity as a school system. And that, again, they don't just get some handouts, that they get people who now are going to work with them on different levels, even if it's e-learning, et cetera. If virtual has not taught us anything, then it certainly should have taught us that every child is important and even virtually we find ways to give children the kind of instruction that they need. And to end, what are the questions that we ask every time we have had questions about virtual learning? Will attendance be taken? Parents so, ask it as well. So, excuse me, members of the committee, um, Dr. Adams, Dr. Boswell McComas, Ms. Shea are on the, um, on the call. 
uh, because staff did not have a clear idea of exactly which changes you wanted to board policy 5210. So that is the reason that staff asked that this be placed on the agenda so we know exactly which changes you wanted to see in that board policy. And I don't know if Dr. Uh, Bosmo McComas, Dr. Adams, Ms. Shea have any other questions. I, I, I do. Um, thank you, Ms. Howie and um, Chair Kazi, if I um, could have a moment. It, in, reviewing our policy, if I, in reviewing our policy rule and procedures manual and listening to the comments thus far, and certainly this isn't the first time that Mr. Offman has shared some of this with Dr. McComas and Ms. Shea and myself and neither as um, Ms. Pasteur, um, it sounds like um, what board members are describing um, it are, are things that are contained neither in policy nor rule, but are actually in our procedures manual. And I'm wondering, um, because part of what's being um, shared, um, if they are anecdotes from the field, um, do not sound to me to be accurate in terms of what we intend based on our procedures manual, so I'm wondering, um, tonight might not be enough time to clarify. I certainly can do it briefly, but I'm wondering if it might not be permissible or the will of this committee that Dr. McComas, Ms. Shea, and I could provide sort of an overview of how the procedures came to be what they are um, and what those rationale were. Um, you know, for example, um, our the research showed us that we should only, the only thing that should go in to a student's grade is his or her mastery of understanding. Um, that led to, as Mr. Offerman and Ms. Pester have shared, a decoupling of attendance from achievement. Our former policy that was in place for decades um, had automatic percentage reductions if students weren't attending. Um, and we have, in fact, um, and, and one of the ways we approach it is we believe that students should have to be in attendance to learn and, and, and um, demonstrate mastery. If Bernard cannot be in attendance and still demonstrate mastery, then perhaps we need to address rigorous instruction because maybe that shouldn't be the case. I do also wanna share that I, it, hurt, it sounded as if on one of Mr. Offerman's um, examples, sounded like what we call students cutting classes than being in multiple lunch periods. And our procedures manual says that Students do not and are not entitled to redo assignments that they miss without an excused absence. It is um, pretty clearly outlined that, you know, there's one thing if Ms. Shea is sick and she needs, um, you know, an assignment that she missed. But if Ms. Shea simply doesn't um, come to school and doesn't have a note or she doesn't ever attempt the assignment, um, she is not entitled to redo those assignments. And certainly we understand with over 9,000 teachers and 175 schools, that there uh, may be some misinterpretations there, um, but it, it, it's from the initial comments, and I don't wanna make that the entirety of everything, it sounds as if there may not be clarity in the procedures, um, what they were intended to do and how they are implemented. So I'm wondering um, if there are not in fact changes to the actual policy, but um, suggested challenges with the procedures manual if we might not want to begin with perhaps at, a, at, at next month's meeting an overview of the actual procedures and what, gr what grounds them, and then we could better understand how we could go and form you know, a stakeholder group if that's what, what we would need to do to then look at um, revisions, clarifications, additional professional learning around our actual grading and reporting procedures. Thank you. Dr. Adams, thank you for that. And I do think that uh, what you're speaking to would be appropriate to do in a future meeting. And what um, Mr. Offerman and I, as uh, the chair and the vice chair of the committee wanted to do is have the opportunity for the board members to express um, insights or concerns and also point to, as Mr. Offerman uh, indicated, what is some additional information that could be presented to the policy review committee to understand if we feel the policy is fine the way it is, and if there is inconsistent application of procedures, then that's uh, a different issue. Um, so I really do appreciate that. Um, so what I'd like to do is just take a moment and have uh, Mr. Mahamza had his hand up and Ms. Rowe, and then I had just a couple comments, and then we can 
talk about what the next steps are. Um, Mr. Mahamza, are you still with us? Yeah, um, I'll defer to Ms. Rowe. Ms. Rowe? So I really just have a couple questions for clarification. Um, and my question is, in the high school, I grew up in New York City. But I'm I sorry, I can't hear Ms. Rowe. Uh, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Better, thank yes. you. Okay. Um, in the high school that I went to, your grading and your attendance were disconnected, but you were not able to graduate in high school if you had missed a certain percentage of days. And I wanted to know if that is the case here. So do we require high school students to keep a certain attendance rate in order to qualify for graduation? Because I could understand disconnecting attendance from their grades if we have that qualification, but I am equally concerned that not connecting attendance to anything could create a situation where people are just being passed through the system without knowledge. If someone has an answer to that presently, that's fine. But if that needs to be brought to us at the next meeting, that is OK as well. Um, just quickly, I would share um, for Ms. Rowe, thank you for that question. The State Department of Maryland has um, in past, I, I want to say within the last decade, because I can't narrow it down closer to that, they have increased the age um, of mandatory attendance to include high school students to stress the importance of attendance. Um, there is not a, a current requirement um, that I understand that says if you don't attend a certain number of days, you cannot graduate, but we will research that and get back to you. Thank you. And then Ms. Pasture, had you finished with your points? Um, uh, um, essentially, um, I, I guess I, my bottom line point was that I understand that this is about our rules and regulations, but we have not had the, the word standard. When we were connecting the two, there really weren't standards um, from school to school about how attendance was applied to instruction. So yes, I want that to be carefully looked at because removing it to numbers, one, two, three, I'm pretty sure that, that when schools, unless they get to the end and also work, they are not really worried about whether or going to ask whether in high school you had a one, two, or three. Um, they want to know how you fared. Um, I heard everything that everyone said, but I really would like all of it to be checked, looked at again um, in real time and talk to some different teachers. And maybe that's been done and principals. Maybe I've been out the loop but, um, when that was being done. But I know that there were discrepancies. There were differences from school to school, et cetera, how it was all handled. So I'm fine if it's going to be reviewed um, and and take a look at um, take a look at how we do things in the system to make sure that we really do have equity. Thank you, Ms. Pastor. Um, and I just wanted to make a few moments, a uh, few quick comments. Um, for uh, consideration at the next um, the next time that we get together, because I don't know, we'll have to work out what works for um, staff um, and the timing of other policies, whether it's the next meeting, um, is that the policy talks about consistent and fair process for evaluating grading and reporting student progress that is understandable to students and their parents. Um, consistent meaning throughout the school system. Um, and then grades are, the board believes that grades are an essential way to communicate student progress. Um, so one of the things in the, that I've heard as a concern 
is uh, what was previously called a low score, where if students had um, attempted but then um, didn't make progress on an assignment or an assessment, that then they were given a low score of 50, even though their actual score may have been lower than that. So I would be interested in hearing the procedures around that, the current procedures, um, and also in terms of grading homework, where um, it was determined in the procedures that um, there were certain things that teachers could assign, but that they would not contribute to the student's grade. So, um, because what we've seen, what I have seen, is when we raise expectations, as Ms. Pesture pointed out, and have the children rise to meet them, um, that is helpful. Um, whereas if we don't require them or don't encourage them, um, then some students, and I think Mr. Offerman made a point about the high school students, um, may be less likely to do the work that will actually provide them with the opportunity to master the content. So those were things that I would be interested in, in hearing because again, it's all about the children achieving and um, the teachers, both their current ones, but future ones, being able to identify the student's achievement. Are they able to achieve at a high level and let's move them up to the next level. Let's not hold them back. Let's move them up to the next level of rigor. Or for a parent to understand that a student might actually be struggling, um, but their grades don't really reflect that. So that's the concern, is how can we make sure that our people are, all are, all are achieving their goals? And I will um, finish up and let Nikita, Ms. Scott, you had your hand up? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, just had a, a question, and I just this is basically to recap to make sure I understand. Um, what we're looking at or discussing is tying a student's attendance to their grading and to their um, ultimately their achievement. So basically, um, their attendance is is tied to their grades. Like if they're if they hand in all their work and do tests, and they and they have like a hundred a score of hundred percent of their attendance has has been i don't know is there like a percentage that we're measuring that by um i guess it was just like a little bit more um, information on that so is there um dr Ren dr adams said that they're going to look into the lily's miss rose question about um attendance as an overall requirement for graduation and i think mr offerman was speaking to um time frame when um, he was also in the school system where there was a tie between attendance. So I don't know who could um, best answer that. Dr. Adams, I see. I, I'm here. Um, Ms. Scott, could you repeat your question? Your sound cut out for me a little bit, and I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear everything you asked. Oh, sorry. Um, what my question is, is it, are we saying that we're tying attendance to their grades, so their attendance is tied to their grade and their achievement and their ability to graduate. And I wanted to know if there was a percentage that was tied to that attendance. Um, like if you uh, attend less than 50% of the time or 75%, um, what is the m measure um, that we would be using? Or is that what we're exploring? Thank you for that. Um, currently, uh, there is not a connection between students' grades and attendance. Um, there used to be in previous policy, which I mentioned was in place, I believe, for decades. I think it went back to the 70s or the early 80s. I'll have to check my notes. Um, what I, I would like to share, however, is that schools, however, are still held accountable for student attendance. Um, through the Elementary and Secondary uh, Schools Education Act, um, schools are monitored in terms of their attendance rate as well as the percentage of students who are chronically absent. And so that's another measure by which in conjunction with um, the state increasing the age, the minimum age by which uh, attendance is mandatory, there are requirements placed on schools. If I may go back to just um, one thing that Ms. Pasteur shared and one thing that 
um, Chairwoman Causey shared, just um, to share more information. I know you asked for a future update, but I would like to share if I could in the next minute. Um, in terms of stakeholder meetings, um, the first year that the procedures were implemented, there were monthly on grading and reporting stakeholder committee meetings. The second year, um, as you might imagine, over time, some things um, quelled slightly. So the second year, those meetings were held every other month. And then the third year of implementation, those meetings were held quarterly. Um, and so over time, what we found is that as a staff, we were receiving um, fewer questions and concerns around overall implementation. Um, and the other thing um, that I would like to just add, um, Ms. Causey, to your point around homework, um, it was unfortunately oft reported in the media that we had done away with homework and that there was no longer going to be homework and that homework wasn't graded. And so one of the things we did, um, and I, I'm sorry off the top of my head, I cannot remember the exact school year, but we put in additional clarification that shared that there are many purposes for homework. Sometimes, you know, my math teacher would give me homework that was really intended for me to practice my skill. And there were other times that my teacher gave me homework that was maybe a biology lab or it was new me to demonstrate new learning. And so what we tried to clarify based on the research, the research really says that if the if the assignment is really just to practice skill to like rote repetition, like my multiplication tables that perhaps we don't score that and give that a grade. However, if the homework and the home assignment is the application of skills to demonstrate my knowledge, an essay, a lab report, a theorem, um, that we do grade that. And so that is contained in the procedure manual, um, descriptions that sort of delineate when you might assign homework for practice versus when you might assign homework that would in fact factor into the student's grade. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adams. And it is 626 and in the interest of time and a hard stop um, by Ms. Howie. And we also have a board member um, that will be departing at 630. Um, I would like to, um, if there are no objections from the committee members to um, take Ms. Uh, Dr. Adams up on the um, presentation by curriculum and instruction at um, the next PRC meeting. And I would ask board members to submit questions, comments, um, or points to be considered so that it can be um, a targeted presentation. So if there's no objections, we'll move on from policy 5210. Thank you. Ms. Howie, was there other yes, items on the agenda that were critical before we adjourn? I do not believe so, ma'am. Everything else should be able to wait until um, next uh, month. Uh, but just so the board knows, item eight, which has to do with the board ethics code policies, the, the committee had asked that those policies be brought uh, for review this year, specifically with respect to the amount of gifts. So what you do have, uh, and certainly the items that were asked to come back um, will be coming back. I appreciate all of the staff that have um, been on the call, been in our virtual meeting, and uh, I appreciate the contribution of all of our board members. And um, we had one final committee, General Good and Welfare, but I would just ask board members to email me and Mr. Offerman is the vice chair of the committee. Any comments that you have and we'll work them into future agenda. Um, and so with that, I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you all.